I'm going to start off with a, a couple of tunes in, in D. Um, the first one is a tune written by a piper called Billy Pig, oh, yeah. and it's a tune called The Gypsy's Lullaby. Um, I don't know, are any of you or were any of you Boy Scouts? If you were and you went to the trouble of going really hardcore and reading Scouting for Boys by Robert Baden Powell, he has a story in there about a shepherd boy who notices um, a tramp sitting against the wall and he's got an odd pattern of um, hobnails on his shoes. When the shepherd gets back to his village, uh, there's an old woman being murdered, and, but the boy notices this odd pattern of hobnail boots, uh, of, of hobnails in, in a footprint. So he tells the authorities, I think it's this fellow who's out sitting on moors up against a wall. So Baden Powell uses this old story um, to show about how an, an alert boy can be observant and solve a crime. And the gypsy was a fellow called Winters, and he, he was hanged for the murder. And this is the gypsy that the lullabies were. This was actually, um, Billy Pig was referring to the, it's, it's not so much a lullaby for going to sleep, it was, it was him being hanged. Um, and at one time on the moors in Northumberland where this had happened, um, there was a monument marking the spot. And it, if any of you who were involved in Northumberland music who'd seen the uh, older LPs of the High Level Rants, they actually had a picture of this monument. And it was basically a huge gibbet with a carved wooden head hanging on it. And I first saw it when I was in my teens. I've been on, on holiday with my family. As you're driving over the moors, you come over a ridge and it's just flat land and uh, out ahead of you. And then you sort of see something that looks like a head hanging on a gallows. You know? And then the, my family's all discussing, well, it could be a pie, one, it could be. A... And then closer you get, no, that's definitely a head hanging on a gallows. But it was massive. It was a, a, a very oversized. And unfortunately, it's been vandalized and taken down now. But... So that's the Gypsy's Lullaby, and I will follow that with more of a so.
Right. The French tune that got taken over by the Scots and then stolen by an old um, uh -huh. <clears throat> This is a tune that in Scotland and in Northumberland is known as Happy Hours. But it started life as a, a French um, folk tune, or a tune written for, for folk dancing um, in the musette style of accordion playing. And the name is totally different in France. Um, it was written by a man called Emile Vacher, who um, was a musician, and I believe his wife owned uh, one of the dance halls that was used for French dancing in Paris. So he would play and she owned the building, and they you know, made a living out of, of having folk dances. Um, the tune got picked up by Jimmy Shan, the Scottish accordion player, who played it a little differently from the way that um, Vasher had originally written it, uh, but he recorded it and he called it Happy Hours. Um, and then Billy Pig picked it up from the recordings of Jimmy Shan, and he plays it differently from the way Jimmy Shan played it. Um, in one of the books that Matt Seattle published, he lays out the, the way that I play it and most of our pipes play it, we just go to A music, B music, C music. And Matt lays out how Shan played it, which was sort of something like A, B, A, B, C, A, C, B, A. <laughs> Shall we a D somewhere? And you know, it was all over the place. So this is the, the way it's coming to Northumbrian piping. And oddly, there is a, taking it back into accordion, there is a recording by a, um, an Irish accordion player called Martin O'Connor, yeah. where he lists on the, on the track list, happy hours. But he plays a totally different tune. But it is a tune that is on the Billy Pig album that Happy Hours is on. So I know that Martin O'Connor learned it from Billy Pig, but he got the wrong name off the album. So it sort of went back from a North American back into the accordion position elsewhere. So.
a way, he was right that they're unique. <laughs> they're unique in the fact that Patrick can swing both ways. Patrick can play legato or staccato. Northumbrian pipes can't. I've got no hole in my bottom, and boy, do I have stomachache by this time of time. Um, so <clears throat> we we play staccato. We have one finger off the chanter at a time, hopefully. Um, the other thing is we have multiple drones, so the tunes I've just played were largely in D, so I have D drones on, now I've retuned to G. Um, and the next couple of tunes I'm going to play, um, I would like to dedicate to my friend Bob Mitchell, who gave me a, a lift up here yesterday from um, JFK Airport. And on the way we were talking about various events we've talked at, um, and uh, other musical experiences and he was saying about one event he'd been playing at where he was basically leading a Scottish small pipe session for Highland Pipers who'd all been learning how to compete all day and he said it got a bit boring he said because I I didn't want to have to start with Rowan Tree and Green Hills yet again <laughs> at which point I thought but I'm planning on playing those tomorrow night <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm dedicating it to you, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> so, Green Hills of Tyrol, most Scottish pipers know, uh, or anybody who knows history of it, are told that this was learnt by, or, or heard by a pipe major, major John McLeod, I believe it was, on the, his way to the Crimean War, and there was a Sardinian band playing um, a tune from Rossini. And he heard it and liked it and he arranged it for Highland Pipes and called it the Green Hills of Tyrol. I was going through a, a manuscript of a piper called Lionel Winship and, and the one date in this manuscript is 1833, so 20 years before the Crimean War. And in this manuscript there is the Green Hills of Tyrol. So I did a bit of digging, and I knew that the Green Hills of Tyrol was from uh, Rossini's um, William Tell. But it turns out that not long after William Tell um, was first performed, uh, a songwriter or a lyricist called George Linley set words to this particular part of the opera music, and he, set, he called it, the, his song, The Green Hills of Tyrol. And that was published in Britain, there was a version published in the States in 1830, so again, we're way ahead of the story we're told about how it came to be, the pipe tune came to be, the Green Hills of Tyrol. Um, and so probably Winchy heard it, if it was getting sung as a parlour song, and he adapted the tune. So, parts of it you'll recognise exactly like the Scottish version, and then there's other bits where it deviates from that, but if you actually listen to the opera, it's exactly how the tune goes in the opera. Um, and then I was going to follow that with the Rowan Tree, because that's another Scottish tune that Northumbrian pipers have, have stolen and played, and it just seemed to go nicely, and then I discovered that it upset Bob, so... <laughs> <laughs>
couple of older Northumbrian tunes with the common theme of keel men or keels. Um, Newcastle and the surrounding area in the northeast of England was a major coal producing area and there's quite a lot of tunes that are connected to the coal industry um, and, and mining. But another aspect of the coal industry was shipping coal out of Newcastle. And uh, the River Tyne had a deep water channel in the middle, but not but was shallow at the side, so it wasn't really possible to bring the coaling ships all the way up, bring them to the dock and load them. So there were a type of rowing boat called a keel that would be loaded with coal and they'd be rowed out to the deep water and then the coal was offloaded. And obviously the fellows who operated these were called keel men. Um, so the first tune is called Keel, keel Man O'er Land. Um, and the second one is a tune called the Keel Row. Um, now the Keel Row, I heard somebody on a Squash Piking Forum once say, oh, that's named after a row of houses, but no. The song that this came from, the chorus was, we'll made the keel row, the keel row, the keel row, we'll made the keel row that my lad is in. So basically saying, good luck to my boyfriend's keel. Um, and so that's just been abbreviated down to keel row. And keel row is, uh, this is a tune with variations, but it's slightly different to the way most Northumbrian variations go, in that this, as far as we know, it was written by a man called Shields, who um, I believe was an organist at the main cathedral in Newcastle. And it doesn't stick to um, building up on the, the basic tune in the same way as most traditional um, variation sets does. It's, in a way, it's, it's a tune with um, musical fantasy variations on it rather than a straightforward variation set. Um, so I will give that a go for you, but to start off with Keel Man Over Land.
couple of stolen Scottish tunes <laughs> again. Um, the Northumbrian pipe sort of developed from a single octave um, chanter to one with quite a range, largely so they could play fiddle tunes. So these are two tunes by Scott Skinner, the Scottish fiddle player. And as I just made that introduction, it's just dawned me that having said that these two are both Scott Skinner tunes that fall within the original range of the Northumbrian chanter. So <laughs> I am not using the fact that I can play more um, complicated fiddle tunes in this case, but these are two tunes that are named for Scottish regiments that were, the first is the Lovett Scouts, and the second is the Cameron Highlanders. <coughs> Thank you. 